You know Deb as a fellow docent, so you know a lot about her already. Um, you also know that she's an artist and you've probably seen her work on several different occasions over the years. Um, what you may or may not know is that she began her professional career, or her first professional career was as a lawyer, and um, it was due to uh, a medical injury, a medical issue that I think in part at least led her into doing art and doing sort of the kind of art that she's been doing which is very involved with um, numbers, counting, statistics, quantification. Um, and so this is the most uh, recent body of work, actually you've probably made two or three bodies of work since this, but um, this is a recent body of work which continues in that vein. And the title is sort of a double entendre, um, Wasted. Um, and maybe she'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, it's rare that we get a, get a chance to say, you know, that something is direct from New York. And in this case, <laughs> In this case we do because this body of work, uh, including the prints and actually more of the prints, there are more of the prints in that series, were shown at the Kim Foster Gallery in New York last year. And um, we had shown one of these triptychs in the Hawaii Art Now show in 2011, was it? It's this, this one. one, yeah, that's the first Wasted. one. Uh, you may remember it from there, but then she went on to create Wasted 2, two and 3, plus the body of prints. So. Um, I think the works look wonderful in the space and I'm really glad to have the opportunity to show them here at the museum for our community. So I'll turn it over to Deb. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's a thrill to be here. And um, I'm glad Jay gave that little background so I don't have to. The one thing he left out is that um, not only was I a lawyer but I was a rabble rouser. And that started in high school. I, my best friend and I led the movement to allow girls to wear pants to school and it moved on to the Vietnam War and that remained in college and in college I had to decide whether I wanted a major in government or art and I at that point was going to change the world so I decided on the political science major and I did that for a while and, and uh, worked on some really interesting issues, met some fabulous people and always with, I will admit it, a progressive agenda. And um, then I, I, had an, I had an accident and that, um, after I moved to Hawaii. I had moved to Hawaii because I was tired of DC and political machinations under a lot of things I was working on um, while I was in DC. And uh, I kept working for a while as a lawyer here and then it was too hard, so. I, um, I left the law, at first temporarily, and I was living in a rich man's house on the beach and got bored after about two, three months and realized I just wasn't meant to stroll the beach all day. So I looked for my, um, my next career, or at least something to keep, not a career, but to keep me entertained. And I thought I'd be the next Scott to row, and I'd write a book, of, you know, mystery about the law practice. And I realized that was way too hard. So I uh, decided to go back to my interest in art, and I ordered some canvases and some acrylics, and started to paint the worst possible paintings you could find of flowers <laughs> and seascapes and windsurfers and all that kind of stuff. And um, a friend back in New York said that I should meet um, Helen Gilbert and Ken Bushnell. She had known them in art school and to see where to go. So I, I went to UH and, to sh and I sh had the nerve to show Helen my paintings and she was so kind. Um, and she just recommended that I become an unclassified grad at the university and because I needed to be social. I needed to meet people. I was, the people I was meeting walking up and down the beach was just not gonna, got, gonna make it for me. And I went to um, UH, started in painting, realized I wasn't cut out to be a painter. It was much too direct for me. And my schedule um, just demanded, I ended up taking a printmaking class because that's what my schedule demanded and it was love at first sight. 
and first experience. And I realized early on that my accidents were much better than my intentions. So um, I, I, I eventually um, I had a kid and um, I wanted to get my kid into the um, preschool at the university because it was reputed to be one of the best preschools. So I had to really get my act together and start getting serious about the art classes I take because I didn't have a BFA. And I think I was the last person to be accepted by the university's master's program um, with no credentials whatsoever. <laughs> I'd never get in today based on the portfolio I had back then. Um, but I had an amazing graduate committee and literally got whipped into shape. And I had to start, in graduate school, I've, I've said you can't just make art that looks good, it has to make art that means something. And, and at the time I was dealing rather newly with the chronic pain I had from my injury and I realized I was making these etchings um, using plates that were like, burned through in the acid and, and um, I realized I was trying to, to take sort of destructive techniques and make it look good. And it was about dealing with what I was going through, what my body was going through. And then the epiphany for me was um, going to a, um, an exhibit that Tom Cloby at the university had curated um, on artist books. And there was a book by a Holocaust survivor and it was about the tattoos. And, and the idea of, of seeing these burnt numbers just struck a chord. And at the time I was doing these um, photo etchings of, of creases of my body, sort of ambiguous creases of my body, and I realized that I, what, I couldn't burn the numbers on my body because that wasn't my personal experience, but it was cultural and Jewish, so it was, it was an experience of, of my people. And so I, I decided to you know, explore avenues of using this burning, this branding on paper. And paper became a metaphor for skin, and the burning became a metaphor for my personal pain. So my early works were about that, the, uh, the, the idea of quantification and, um, and these numbers, going to doctors and having them rate, ask me to rate my pain on a scale of one to 10. Uh, <laughs> you know it, huh? And um, so my, my earlier works were these fields of burnt numbers, of basically numbers kind of five through 10. Of, of, and then um, that worked its way out for a while and then it became more about endurance and starting to handwrite numbers, um, sequential numbers. Again, that was about endurance, endurance and, and endlessly coping with something. And um, that worked well for a while and then, um, but I knew that my, my goal was to make this political work because I was, I'm a political junkie, a political animal, I, I, I care, I can't stop caring. Um, and, but I, I knew that my art had to be in my own voice. I didn't want to make agiprop or, you know, post words on it. And, you know, some people do that really effectively, but that wasn't, I had to find my voice. And, um, uh, there's a, there was a small gallery, um, an artist and her friend trying to open, did open in Kailua, um, Jody Endicott and Linda Van Geldern. Um, and they wanted to do a show on the war in Iraq. And they said, Deb, you want to, it was called War and Peace. And I said, they asked if I want to be part of it. And I said, you bet. And that was my challenge. So this was in 2004, late 2004, 2005. And the, the process, I mean, it probably took me six to eight months to um, get my concept down because this was, this was the ultimate test to myself. And I eventually came up with a piece that, that, um, that worked. It was, it were, um, it's on my website. It was called Collateral Damage, and it was about the, the, dam the, the people that died, the, the um, Iraqis and the coalition soldiers. And, um, and it was up on the, it, I was going to do it until the war ended and then, but I, I just could after five scrolls and going through 2003 to 2010, 
I just closed it at that point. And so it's five 30-foot scrolls, uh, about 33 inches wide. And um, it, it, I think it pretty effectively tells the story. And the first people to see it at the gallery were um, a, a military spouse and her mother. And they loved it. And I knew that I was OK, because as a Vietnam-era child, I you know, still shudder at the way our, vet, our veterans and our boys coming home, those that did, were treated. And I, this just had to be respectful. And um, so then I moved on. I said, what am I going to do next? And I was talking to a friend. I said, well, to, to devote that amount of time and energy, it had to be something I was passionate about. So at that point, I was passionate about camp. I couldn't wait for George Bush not to be president. So I did some pieces about the last days of his administration. And, and then in, you know, and there were, I did a piece that was up in Spalding House about the genocide in Darfur. And all very obsessive, repetitive with numbers, and um, just trying to use my art to help people, to, to reach people beyond the, the intellect, to get, to get art to sort of affect them on a more visceral level, to start thinking about these issues in a, in a different setting, in an art gallery setting or a museum, as opposed to where you traditionally talk about these issues. Um, and then in, uh, I guess, 2010, I mean, the, the gun violence issue has always um, just been something I've thought about. And the, 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 in, as, as the NRA became stronger and stronger, I became crazier and crazier. And I decided that that was where I <laughs> So the, I... I, I um, I was talking about the, the challenge of finding um, statistics on deaths, but, uh, um, gun violent deaths in adults as well as children. And then I, in my research, I realized that one of the things that the NRA managed to get Congress to pass was a law banning collection of this data, even though co they collect data on all other kinds of homicides and, and death. And uh, so I had to deal with what I had, and I, came, I was able to get data on the number of deaths of juveniles, so that was 18 and under, um, in the years 2003, 2004, 2005. So each hole represents a death by a gun. And then, um, I, hope you have, I hope you'll take a chance to come and look closer, but the holes have stitches over them. And the red crosshairs are homicides, and the black X's are suicides. And then there are the um, holes left blank, and they are uh, unintentional deaths or deaths for which there was no information. Um, and I think I'm going to talk about the concept, and then I'll talk about the, the, the making of it and the, you know, coming up with, with how I, I um, came up with the composition and what that stood about. But you may want to, when I was done with this, and, oh, I'm going to contradict myself and talk about how I came up with the pattern. Because the paper is um, this handmade paper from Nepal, which those of you that saw the piece at Spalding House saw it unwaxed. I wanted to get, I wanted to find something that kind of looked like skin. And so the best I could come up with was this paper, which I coated with beeswax, and then I crumpled it. And um, I drew what to me, was originally a target, still is. Um, but when this piece was up in Hawaii Art Now, uh, people saw many really interesting things. They saw an eye. They saw a planet. They saw the moon. And some people saw the barrel of a gun, which I thought was you know, really kind of interesting. And it took a while <laughs> to, to, to wax these things. And then I, I did the. Um, the, the, the target in graphite, and then um, I kind of, because I wanted to highlight these creases, and then if you come and look closely, you can see that I then went in with a dull mat knife and I striated them, I scratched them. So that again was a reference to bullets and the striation that, at least on CSI and Law and Order, they say that's what they, <laughs> that's what they look at when, when they're, they're trying to do the forensics. And so I had done the first piece, 
And this is about, I was dealing with a figure about 2,800 pieces, uh, 2,800 deaths. And I had no idea, I'd never done work this size before in this kind of way, how much space 2,800 holes would take. And um, so I started burning randomly. But I can't close my eyes when I burn. And I'll explain the way I do that later. Um, so uh, it was, my mind was interfering and I ended up with sort of this pattern that looked like measles or cons a cons constellations. But ne in neither case was it working. It would have been distracting. So I had to, to figure out what else to do. And um, I had to create another piece, which I wasn't happy about. And um, I had to come up with a pattern to work with. And sort of, I, I ended up with a blood spatter pattern, which you can find. <laughs> If, if anybody's looking at my, uh, my Google history, <laughs> they're going to be really interested um, because that's where I found these blood spatter patterns. So that's where it fit, that's where the pattern comes from. And, um, you know, and when I work on something like this, I never know what it's going to look like, not only until it's done, because I can lay it on the floor, but you still can't see it until it's up. And so when it went up, I was, I was really pleased because it just, um, did everything that I wanted to do. And when it was up in Hawaii Art Now, um, you know, sort of watching people react to it and from far away, oh, that's a nice looking piece of art. And then they get close up and look at the label and to see their reactions. And, and that was, for the most part, really gratifying. And then they'd look, at, they'd look at it again and then they'd start talking. And that's what I want to happen. That's, that's the goal of this. When it was shown in New York, because I was showing in a commercial gallery, my, and, you know, she's got to pay the rent, um, she, um, Kim decided not to put labels on the art. So people, she wanted people to come in and look at the art. And then if they wanted to find out what it was about, there's a book lit up at the front desk and, and most people did want to find out what it was about. So that was a really interesting experiment a la text message you know, that was up there with labels and no labels. But since this is a museum and um, you know, I had no trouble with putting the wall text and um, letting people know, I still hope people will be, you know, come in and look at the art first before they, they look at the, the work. So when I was done with this, I realized I wasn't done with the issue. And I decided I wanted to do a companion piece for the same years but I want to talk about the adults that were killed in the same years. So this is, this is the inverse or the converse. I never know what it is. But, but if, the blood spatter patterns, you know, I've used the, the, the negative space here to fill it in. And this is about 28,000 holes, about 30,000 holes, about 28,000 holes. And what, what I thought was really interesting is you could see here that suicides, the black stitching, is, is um, more, you know, it, it's, it outweighs the red stitching. And that's true that guns are used, you know, more people are killed by guns than more adults. So, um, and I did count, you know, I, I, I had the counts, these, these, the stitching, that was, that was really fun. <laughs> um, so these two pieces, I think this was 2010, maybe done in 2013, and um, I started working, I did some other, other work in between, but I still wasn't done. <laughs> I'm glutton for punishment. And um, so then, then came Wasted Three, and this, um, when the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, stopped collecting data um, then other, you know, the, the activist gun control groups and, and state um, health departments started compiling their own data. So I was able to find out this is um, some average statistics. And so I wanted to combine kids and adults. So this piece represents an average number of gun violence deaths from a, a four year period from 2010 to 2014. And again, it totals about 30,000. Um, 
In one of my past lives, I was a forensic pathologist. No kidding. And the first thing that I saw in these was the gunshot wound, because you know you see the hole in the center where the bullet went in, and depending whether the muzzle of the gun was pressed tight against the skin, you will see powder burns around it, either just in the area or splattered outside. So that's another horrible interpretation. Yes. Well, you know, that, that I, I was frankly hoping for that effect, you know, <laughs> needless to say. Um, okay, let's see, where's the best place? I think I'm going to move back over there to talk about these other. Sure, but I'm going to get close to you just so okay. you can be heard. I just noticed that um, in this Wasted 3 that the target area is free of any, um, any burn. It, yes, it was, it was just, um, that was an aesthetic choice, okay. you know, just to, to <laughs> I didn't know where else to go <laughs> with it, frankly, so. But, yes? You said red represented. <laughs> Homicides, black, suicides, and what was the other? The, there are holes that don't have stitching on yeah, them, and they're stitching. unintentional deaths. Okay. Or, um, and in Wasted 3, there are holes where there are um, covered by crosses, red and black, and those were police shootings. Mm -hmm. And it's unclear you know, what, what was behind those. Are these nylon or cotton threads? Cotton, cotton threads. Continuous it's a continuous here. I'm, I, I, can I touch it since it's my word? <laughs> so they're continuous stitches. Okay. And actually, you know, as is in the case in a lot of my work, some, the backs are kind of really interesting too, um, in my view. So it's just, it, they're continuous stitches, and then there are some thread lines oh, yeah. that you can see. Yeah. Oh, God, if I had to knot after every one, <laughs> I'd be, I'd be more, more off the wall than I already am. It would be interesting to install them <clears throat> off the wall so you could see both sides, but they also throw a really beautiful the, lace yeah. I should, yeah, yeah, no, that's why I didn't want them <laughs> nailed down at, at the end. <clears throat> As I said before, printmaking is my first love, and um, one of the really wonderful experiences I've had in printmaking is meeting a master printer named Paul Maloney, who was at the Hui Noe Ao in Maui, and when the Hui Press closed in 2008, he moved to San Francisco and opened his own press. And coincidentally, my son was in college in the Bay Area, so darn if I didn't need to go to San Francisco. <laughs> and pay some visits, and I, it allowed me to continue to work with Paul. And um, when I burn um, marks on paper, I work, this is a small sheet, I work on plywood that is two, uh, two feet by four feet, and it's down on top of flat files. And then I use a butane torch and my handy vice grip, and in this case, in the case of holes, I use titanium screws that were taken from my back. <laughs> but the amazing thing, yes, but the amazing thing about these titanium screws is that they go forever. I mean, I've used this one screw to burn almost 100,000 holes or, or 60,000 holes. So um, I, the, that's, that's a little inside story that will probably gross people out. But what was really funny is when I told the surgeon that I wanted, um, this, I wanted to keep the screws from my back, he said, oh, we always give the hardware. And as a matter of fact, a nurse from the OR came when I was recovering and brought me, we found one more piece. You know? <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> So I, I thought that was kind of interesting. This, I'll, I'll, I'll um, pass that around. That's the paper before it's waxed. And it's amazing paper because it can come twice this size, um, something like 68 by you know, 120 inches. 
but I wanted them to be triptychs. I didn't want to do it in, in one piece. But I'll work on a piece of plywood. The paper will go over this. And then the vice grip holding the, the whatever I'm using to brand the marks will um, make marks on the wood. And as a printmaker, well, here's, a beautiful, here's something to print. But since I was working on two by four foot blocks, I didn't want to, I, I, doing that on my own would be a real challenge. So that was when I started working with Paul, as I had from my pre previous bodies of work. I have literally libraries of these um, pieces of plywood with these burn marks in them that were really beautiful, and I wanted to print them. And so when I um, was working, I worked the same way on these pieces, and again, I had you know, eight different pieces of plywood with you know, random burn marks in them, and I wanted to print them. So if you look close at these pieces, you can see that there are dots on them, and those dots are the ink, the intaglio ink that was used to um, ink up these, pl these plates. So imagine a two foot by four foot piece of plywood, and we're printing it in the intaglio technique, which means we're applying ink to the surface, and as we apply ink to the surface, we push it down into these holes. And then we um, try to remove the ink from the surface of the block. In this case, we didn't try too hard to remove that ink. If we'd want to get rid of most of it, we would have shellacked the plate first. But I wanted there to be plate tone. So we, so we ended up, um, initially, these were indigo uh, pieces with, I wish I'd brought my pictures of the first, the first stage. Um, of this constellation of these dark, these dark blue uh, constellation of holes. And then, I mean, I had no idea where I was going with this. It was the way I work with Paul is just sort of to go with it and, um, and see where I end up. And it was kind of, you know, it's just, it, it just needed something. So, so with some experimentation on some smaller pieces, make a long story short, we came up with the idea of um, painting the back with sumi ink. So they, they became really dark. Um, and, and then, you know, it was clear to me, initially I didn't know that they'd be about gun violence, but as they evolved, I realized that they had to be about, you know, sort of a, another step in the, in, the, in the process. So that was the idea of then screen printing these crosshairs. Um, on, on the surface to complete it, you know, aesthetically and conceptually. I have a question. Um, your, your plywood there, everything's kind of in a grid. Yeah. That, what I'm seeing up there, it's not. This, this, this is not a plate that was used for that. This was just, okay. you know, I have, bur so have other pieces. Oh, yeah, these, these plates, literally, they're just, you know, they con the, the constellation of holes looks very similar to some of these marks here. I just wanted, you can pass this around if you want to and see. And the holes don't go all the way through the No, no, no. If it's really, yeah, because I, I, I use at least uh, a quarter inch. So you have to put it on a press face down, and it has to be. No, but you lay it on the press uh -huh. face up. Okay. Put the paper, the ink, paper over it, blankets over that, and, and the pressure of the press going through the blankets presses the paper sort of into the holes. Into the and that, yeah. Okay. And the other thing about Paul is when I had tried to, to print on my own, I was printing on Western paper. And I, I initially just wanted to get the burn mark. I mean, Mary talking about, you know, that, that effect of the, the, the residue around it. I, I wanted to get the burn mark printed. I didn't want to put any ink on the plate because the burn mark itself I thought was really seductive. Um, and it, um, it didn't, I was printing on Western paper, which is the only experience I'd really ever had in printmaking, and it wasn't working. So when I met Paul, he said, well, we have to try printing this on Japanese paper, on Kozo. And um, that opened a whole new, new world for me. And so this is actually, it's three layers of paper 
There's a layer of gampi, which is a really thin, very strong uh, Japanese fiber paper. That is, and that's what the, the blue ink is um, printed on. But as we, do you really, do you want to know this technical? Okay. Yes. I should have I brought more, more um, show and tell. Okay, thin layer of gampi, but when we print the gampi, in order to get the best image off the wood, that gampi is then, um, before we run it through the press, we lay a, a, a sheet of a heavier Japanese paper called hoshu or sekishu um, over it, and that's got paste on it. So it's, as it goes through the, the press, that gampi is pasted to the, the heavier paper, and it picks up the ink, and it really shows it well. We painted the back of that with um, the sumi ink, and then Paul then backed that again with another sheet of the Japanese paper. So the backs of these, which I'm not going to show you, are, are um, the natural color paper. They're not black, but it adds more substance to um, you know. It just makes the whole piece a, a little bit stronger. But printing on the Japanese paper is a completely different ex effect and experience and, and process than, than printing on the, the Western paper. How is it different? How is it different? Yeah. Western papers tend to be thicker and they have sizing in them. And that sizing, you know, you have to dampen, you have to, in, for printmaking, you have to soak the paper for, in some cases, 20, at least 20 minutes or so. Um, with the Japanese papers, it, they're lightly sprayed just to make them slightly damp because if you, they, you, they don't have the sizing in them. And so the, the Western paper, um, you know, it, you've, you've seen it. I mean, I've, I've um, but it's, it, I mean, there are heavy Japanese papers, but the Western papers tend to have a, a completely different texture. They pick up the ink differently. They're different fibers. Um, so um, Western papers are often made of cotton, cotton rag. So it just takes the ink differently, or paint, or whatever else you're using. Now, we have uh, Allison, Ro Allison Roscoe is printing, is making paper. Right. What kind of paper is she making? She'll, um, I think she's sticking, she, she'll make any kind, kind of paper. Preparing Japanese paper to make is much more labor intensive because you literally have to beat the, the stems, the, the, um, the kozo bark with, you know, it, it's done, it, traditionally it's done by hand. I don't know whether they've mechanized it in any way. I would assume where they're mass producing this stuff, they've somehow figured out how to do that. But for cotton or abaca, which are, um, and flax, which are the fibers that are used in more Western papers, um, you can see up at Spalding House that Allison donated a Hollander beater to, um, to help make the Western, the Western papers. And you can get, I mean, with Abaca, you know, there, are, there are fibers that are made the Western way that, that can be thin and not have a lot of sizing in them. Cotton has sizing in it um, for the most part. But um, they still, each, each fiber has its own particular traits and they're all different. Do you know what the fibers are in the Japanese paper? No, that's a good question. I noticed that it, you know, it has darker flux of things. Yeah. So it's not, the fibers are not as sort of purely. No, there's not, you know, I would imagine in Nepal, if they're making paper this size, that, you know, I've seen pictures of it, at least some of what I've seen is people outdoors and hanging these outdoors and, you know, things. Have you seen them make paper in Nepal? Yeah. You have? Yeah, but I didn't know enough to. Oh, uh, oh. Yeah, but I've seen them make, and, and many of the Asian, Southeast Asian, and those countries where they do make paper and they do hang it outside. Yeah. And they have these vats. And, yeah. Are these scroll sizes? Is that why they make this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, they're both scroll sizes, and I learned relatively early on in my career to start working on pieces, if I was going to work large, that could scroll, <laughs> roll up so they could be sent, um, as opposed to sending something flat or, or carrying something flat, which I have done, and it's uh, challenging, to say the least. <laughs> well, not just that, but 
getting it in a, a, a taxi or a subway, you know, it, it, traveling around and you want to bring your work to New York. And so there's, there's been that. Did you work I mean, with those um, rectangular um, plywood that you used? Did you work on a table? Or on table? top of my flat files. So I have flat files are, are you've seen in architects' offices mm -hmm. and, and, and he, so they are long and they are, they are flat. Right. And I have two um, files, two five drawer files stacked on top of each other. So it's kind of the perfect height for me to work and provides the perfect work surface. When you're working, this one was very geometric, but would each piece of plywood kind of echo the pattern? Yeah, it would, it, it, nothing was deliberate with the, with the plywood. Yeah. It was just, I mean, my early work in particular, and you know, and this work to some degree is about process. Right. So I would just let it see where it took me. So I would use a piece of plywood for numerous pieces until there were too many holes where I was, you know, starting to, to damage the paper. So they would overlay. I didn't, I didn't really, you know, in, in no case did I decide, oh, I want a piece of, with holes made like this and I'm just going to burn so many holes. I tried that and once again, my intention ruined it. You know? So you'd have a piece of plywood and you might start working the, flat. The work, working flat, but working, say, in the top left, and then you, the, but you take the plywood down. I take the paper down. The plywood the stays in the down, same place. The plywood, and you move the paper yeah, until right. there were no space for right. holes. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. How can you really keep track of the number of holes? I just, I, 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 how many people are in this room? I, you know? I can show you my, be, being the, the, the recovering attorney that I am, I still use yellow pads, and I would make little, little, and, and you know, I can't tell you they're precise, but they're close enough. <laughs> they're close. I thought you were just literally counting. I thought, well, when, gosh, I, so when I was stitching over, I was literally counting, and then, you know, and then, you know, something would interrupt me, the phone or my family or life. And you know, you know, and I think, oh my God, where was I? So, uh, I um, have a outside my studio. Um, my studio is the, the previous owners made this mother-in-law suite. Um, the bottom, they they dug it out literally into the lava rock, so that's made it interesting. Um, and there's a a lanai outside, and at that point there was this really rickety old picnic table. So I would um, take it outside. I, you can buy blocks of beeswax. And I had an iron and I used a, uh, an extension cord. And I literally hit the, put the iron against the, um, the beeswax, drop it on the sheets, and then um, iron the wax on. I have since, after taking uh, an encaustic class up at Spalding House, I think I can figure out how to do it. It's slightly easier. <laughs> It's waxed through. Waxed through. Yeah. And then you crinkle it? Yep. Are you crinkle it before you wax or after? After. Oh, doesn't the wax really like really break? No, well because well it does. It breaks into those crevices, but it also is absorbed into this that's you know, this paper is so fibrous. That's why it works so well with this. So you would literally just Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> well, what's next is up at Coa Gallery right now. And, uh, and it's up through February 10th. Um, I had, you know, this piece, the, the Wasted Three, I, I was doing um, after Sandy Hook, but, um, and you all know what happened yes. in Sandy Hook. I was talking to a, um, a class at the Coa Gallery and David Belke, who runs the gallery there, made sure I told the class what happened at Sandy Hook because they, you know, some of the kids didn't know, which is another story. And um, I had finished this and then just, I think I saw one of the parents interviewed, you know, who's become a real activist and talking about the frustration of even after that, we couldn't do anything about it. Uh, and I wasn't, I, it, it, I, I, being a mother, 
I just, I mean, I couldn't get by it or over it. And I said, I have to do something about kids again. But I didn't want, and I decided I wanted to get to the specifics. And oh, the other trigger, so to speak, was reading about the two-year-old who shot his mother in Walmart in Idaho because she left her purse on the, in the grocery cart and she had a loaded gun in her, her purse and he's sitting there and takes it and ruins everybody's life. Um, and so, um, and, you know, some of the blogs that I read, there are, the blogs have taken to keeping statistics that the government will, uh, won't. And there, um, I decided I wanted to do a piece about the specifics of children shooting children mm -hmm. or shooting themselves. And so um, I did, there is a piece up at the Koa Gallery now. I'm in a show with Ida Wong, Reem Basus, whose work you've seen downstairs, and Pratisha Budi Raja, who um, is a, new to printmaking, uh, new, new to art, and um, did a fabulous installation. Uh, but I did, a pe I did a piece about the specifics. And believe it or not, well, there's sewing in my work here, and sewing really became prominent in my work after my son left for college, and that wasn't deliberate, but <laughs> I just noticed that that was starting to happen more. Um, I, uh, w I wanted to use, for another piece I had done, I had used QR squares. You know what QR squares are? They're the second generation barcodes. So if you look at ads, you'll see this, this box, black and white box, it's, it's data. And I had incorporated QR codes to, for this other piece where you could read about what I was writing about um, in the piece itself. And I decided that that was a way, you know, if I could do it in, an, in a visually effective way, it would be interactive. People could scan it with their phones. And, you know, it, it, another way to bring viewers coming in as part of the piece. So I ended up needlepointing 60 QR codes, um, each telling the story of a child 10 years old or younger um, shooting themselves or another child with a gun in the 12 months since Newtown, since Sandy Hook happened. So from December 14th to December 13th, 2012 to 2013. So I had to, I originally wanted to do all, ch all children but that would have, you know, it would have been about 150, you know, of, of, of so. So I, were these um, both deliberate and accidental, or? Did, yes. Did oh, no, it, with kids? Yeah. It, kids, it was all accidents. It was all accidents. It was all accidents. It was, you know, to me it's about, you know, yeah. it, it lock, I, I understand people want their Second Amendment rights and, you know, I don't need to exercise it, other people do, I respect that. Just lock them up. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's just, it, it, it is such a no-brainer to me, and it, when something like this happens, nobody's life is ever the same. And it's, it's just carelessness, it's never deliberate. And, is it children under 10? Yes, and as young as 18 months, you know, it's, it's just, um, so, so there are these, each, they're each individual, um, eight, around eight by eight, and then I've needle-pointed little collages around them, and some are kind of obvious that they're gun collages, but others are not so obvious. So, um, and that will be a continuing, you know, there, there, there's, there'll be the successive generations, but not 60 of them. I'm gonna start consolidating statistics again. Um, so, but I have actually, I am work, starting to work on another project that doesn't have to do with gun violence, so I'm branching out. <laughs> um, when, <clears throat> when exactly did you come up with the title Wasted? Oh, that was, <clears throat> uh, coming up with titles and writing labels is always the ultimate challenge, at least for me, but I think for a lot of artists. And um, what I do is I just go through with a thesaurus and put in violence and, you know, just, and I'm also from the East Coast and puns are in my blood and, you know, double entendres and all that kind of thing. So I, you know, in this search, or, or somebody, I don't even remember somebody, I might have said, what a waste, and I said, oh, you know, there it is. 
Um, you know, that's. And it happens to have sort of another. Well, that's yeah. that's the point. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, and and you know, it works on a lot of levels. That, and so I think it's an effective title. And uh, my my other um, the title of this this piece at Koa isn't quite so subtle. It's called "What's Wrong with This Country." <laughs> But the piece isn't so subtle either. You know, it's... Any other questions? Well, thank you. Oh. I'm going to do a, a tea and tour called Not So Civil Rights. Oh. And uh, I was just kind of waiting.